OK, good morning, everybody. Um, you're very welcome to the EPA workshop on the 2021 Code of Practice for Domestic Wastewater Treatment Systems that was published in the EPA website on the 24th of March this year. Just to introduce myself, Noel Byrne is my name. I'm the manager of the wastewater enforcement team in the EPA, which also covers domestic wastewater treatment systems. So I hope you're looking forward to the morning session. Um, so sit back and relax. You're going to have a, a number of presentations and we're going to follow up that with a Q&A session. Um, I suppose from everyone's perspective here, anyone joining in today looking to have a particular interest um, in domestic wastewater treatment systems, or indeed that's part of your job and what you do when installing them. Um, so everyone here has a particular interest in it. I guess it has been a very significant piece of work to get to this point today. So a couple of specific thank yous to our lead authors, um, Stephen McCarthy um, from the EPA, Dr. Robbie Mean, who consultant as well as the two co-authors on the document, and also Professor Gill, who provided some technical support to the document. I'd also like to acknowledge the role of the steering committee, uh, which considered and appraised the proposed changes to the code. Um, so those are quite valuable and good for you know people to look across those comments that came in and the changes that were proposed. I suppose quite importantly as well to the whole process was the public consultation step, where there was you know over 500 comments came in really in relation to that, and all these issues had to be considered prior to finalising the document. So a particular thanks for that. And look at, indeed, I suppose what we've ended up with now, really from my perspective, I think we have a very good technical document, flows well and is easy to follow. Now, it mightn't be everyone's bedtime read, but just you have a good, concise, technical document in that sense, and I think it flows more easily. So that's the general sense of the feedback we've got today. Now, we are using Microsoft Teams for this, so hopefully that'll work well for people. It's the platform that we use. The, the web or workshop is being recorded, um, so you will have the opportunity. It will be up on the EPA website, so go back and look at sections, look at the presentations, or listen to the listen to them. Um, it will be on our website for that. You know, we have come across some technical difficulties yesterday. A few things dropped out for a couple of seconds, and then they kept back in. If that happens, just hang in there, and the system should reboot for you, or the team should come back up. And um, was a, a global issue we were told yesterday. Um, so if that happens, just hang in there. We'll be still continue with the presentation. There's a Q&A function up on the right hand side of your screen. If you want to put in a question that you want to ask today, please feel free to do so. We'd like to see those questions coming in. I'd ask you if you are submitting a question, put in the chapter that you're referring to, so whatever, if it's chapter six, then put in your question and then put in your email address because we may not be able to get to all questions today, but what we will try, endeavor to do is get back to people and if you have your email address, we'll be able to get back to you. If you do happen to click the full screen, by chance, the Q&A tab, you won't be able to see it. So just click escape uh, on your computer and that will bring you back to normal seed and you'll, you'll see the Q&A function. The other thing I've noticed was really the questions we want to deal with today are around the code and the changes to the code, but we're not going to go into site specific issues. So we'd ask the people to refrain from say, you know, I have this site and this is my question. We won't be dealing with any questions like that. Those are site specific and that's really between the person installing the system and maybe the local authority. So we won't be getting um, to any questions like that. Even in addition to questions, the people have comments and we've got you know a number of positive comments back in relation to it. But if you have any kind of comments and you want to put them in there, please feel free and we'll see if we get the opportunity to go through those as well. So how this workshop is going to go, um, we're going to have, uh, I'll just give you an overview now of the agenda. And um, OK, so it's going to be broken down into six six sections, really. I'm going to cover the introduction um, and the review process. Then it's going to be followed up by Stephen McCarthy, and Stephen's going to go through the publication uh, of the code and a high level view of the main changes. And then Dr. Robbie Mean is going to come into that and go through a detailed step by step of the changes within the chapter. And look, while there is a number of changes, we'd have to emphasize was it hasn't been significant change since 2009, a couple of key changes, but fundamentally a lot of things haven't changed as well in this, at the same time. We kind of expect in Gona on yesterday's workshop that we had as well, it'll probably that'll probably take us about an hour to that point. We'll break then for 20 minutes and then we'll come back and we'll have a Q&A session answer that after that. So we're going to take a break where people will, you know, go off, have a cup of, cup of coffee, tea or whatever. It'll be a comfort break for 20 minutes. Then we'll come back at roughly whatever it'll be. It's about half 10, it'll be 10 to 11, we'll be coming back to it. Um, and we'll, we'll look at, come back on the questions and answer then. What I would say is please put in your questions and answers early. Um, so we'd like to have them in as we go through the presentations. Don't leave them to the end because there's a chance that we won't be able to get to those questions. So if you have some questions, please put them in early um, so we can see them, so we can start 
start straight away. If you so wish, and then just build up a bank of questions, which we'll try to go through them then on that break. So I'm going to kick off then, and I'm going to go through my number of slides as, as part of the induction and, and the review process. I suppose the first key thing here, look at why do we do any of this? And the key thing is, look, at there are risks associated with domestic wastewater treatment plants, particularly if they're not installed or not maintained properly. And those two risks are really around health and the environment. So the two factors. And I think if you think of the health side there, and, and it's documented in the code, there's roughly 2 million fecal coliforms per 100 mil of septic tank treated effluent. You know, and if you look at the drinking water regulations, the actual level is zero that they require in drinking water regs for fecal coliforms. So you can see there is a significant potential that exists there for contamination of wells if plants aren't built properly or potentially if you have maintaining issues. So, so that's a key thing, key thing to address. As well as that, on the domestic wastewater treatment side, there's 165,000 sites where the wells and the domestic wastewater treatment systems are co-located. So indeed, if you have a problem with your domestic wastewater treatment system, that risk is this that potentially can get into your well. And that's why you know we want to make sure these systems, as we say, are put in right and operate right. On the water quality side, the domestic wastewater treatment systems, it's a pressure on 11% of the at-risk water bodies. So again, you argue 11% still is something we'd like to see smaller. The one thing I'd say about that is it's only a part of pressure in most of those. So there's other factors as well at those water bodies that are at risk. So you could have agriculture, hydromorphology, other factors at risk. So it's not domestic wastewater on its own. But indeed, we'd like to see that go down. But the other fact you'd have to say there is it's probably, you know, compared to other pressures, agriculture is up around 25 percent, you know, urban wastewater treatments, you know, in the low 20s. So there's other things that are affecting our water quality that are bigger than domestic wastewater treatment. But nonetheless, that's what we're here to talk about today. So we want to make sure we can address and minimise that. I suppose one of the key things for ourselves here is, you know, what we're talking about the code principally today is the new systems that are going to be going in. And we want to be sure that the new systems then don't give rise to any problems. So we don't add to that. And if and then, you know, and if other plants have been remediated, somebody the always been remediated, we actually reduce that risk as we move forward. The other key note, and you probably a lot of you will be aware of the information, 50% of domestic wastewater treatment systems fail inspection. And you see the chart below there, that's the different breakdown of how they break, how they fail the inspection. And roughly it's maybe half and half, that half are down to maintenance, maintenance issues, which could be the solution. But the other 50%, you know, could be, a, a pipe work not going to could be going to a stream, there could be ponding on a garden and so forth. And again, you'd have to look and say, well, actually, if things were built and were in compliance with the code, you wouldn't have these issues. So again, moving forward, um, we want to see that we can eliminate or try to minimise those issues. And as I say, at points, then we get to improve the older ones that are in place. The other key thing to note there as well, there's 4,000 domestic wastewater treatment plants registered per annum. So if you kind of think that's the amount going in per year in the country, it's kind of important to think, well, look, we want these to go in right and that they're, you know, done to a good standard. The next thing I want to kind of talk about is the whole regulatory system of domestic wastewater treatment systems. And if you kind of think, there's a number of players involved here, which, which adds an element to the complexity of it, uh, but it's an important factor to note, and the code obviously is one aspect of that. But if you start at 12 o'clock there, the first key people, and this is where a lot of people listening today would get engaged in the process, it's the engagement with the planning authority. And then obviously, in, with engagement with the planning authority from your own aspect coming into it, you're looking at putting in systems that have to be compliant with the building regs, they should comply with the code of practice, and obviously then SR66 and 12566. So those are all key controls, and they're all around the planning and indeed the new systems, and even probably you're looking at upgrading some of the older systems. As you go around the, the regulatory system, then you have the National Inspection Plan, which is delivered by the local authority and overseen by ourselves. But in that plan, obviously, they're going out and inspecting roughly 1,000 plants a year or in excess of 1,000 plants, and they are identifying issues, as we, as we discussed earlier. There's also the priority areas for action where Law Pro are out doing catchment walks, and they're coming across areas where, you know, they might find septic tanks that are, you know, pipes from them, etc. So they're, if you like, in addition to the National Inspection Plan, but it's more people operating in that space. In the high status objective catchments, these are where people, if you have a, a septic tank that's not operating properly, now you can apply for a grant yourself if it's in one of those areas. Um, so that's a key element as well, a new element that's been provided. Next, you have the grant scheme. So that's a new scheme that's brought out. Um, 
that's there at the moment and it's been administered by the local authorities. But again, that's where people can, you know, if they fail at the system or if they come up under the priority areas for inspection or indeed high status catchment areas, they can look to see can they get a grant. You also have then the registration scheme and there is quite a high percentage of them registered around the country. So you're looking at it, it's up again, the high 90s and the level that's registered. And then obviously you have complaints. So it's a key thing I suppose to consider that actually there's a lot of players involved in this. That adds to the complexity. But I suppose what we want to take from today is look at everybody has a job to do. And particularly for the people joining today, this is the nearly the industry one. You're in that space with the first four, and obviously you hope everything going right. You don't want to fall into the latter ones, or even if you do get inspections, that everything comes up rosy then when you do. Um, but it's just good to see the complexity. Now, if we just take a little look back at the history, I suppose, of where all this has come from and where the code is where the code has developed out of. The National Standards Authority of Ireland brought out their first guidance, SR6, in 1975, which was around, you know, domestic wastewater treatment. And it was the first, I suppose, venture in Ireland of putting some kind of standards in place for domestic wastewater treatment systems or what they're better known as septic tanks. That was superseded by the 1991 document, and so that just updated that. And then, I suppose, nearly 10 years after that, the EPA produced their guidance um, on domestic wastewater treatments after that. Then the code was issued in 2009. That was issued under Section 76 of the EPA Act. And that was the first time where it looked at site assessment and again around the whole concept of selection, installation and maintenance of septic tanks. So it kind of brought a lot of stuff together um, on the whole septic tank process. And it was the first kind of code of practice that was issued from the agency. And really today now we're putting bringing in new code which is an updated version really of the 2009 code and as i said at the start well yes some things have changed and we're going to go through that fundamentally a lot of things have stayed the same which is a positive um to see that because you don't want everything to change too much and really there shouldn't be that reason for it anyhow interesting to look at there though when you look at the percolation values and how they've changed over the years and i guess this is with advancing technologies but you see the percolation value initially was kind of from one to 60 and i suppose the more we understood percolation values and all that and soils and new technologies now that's expanded to three to 120 so that is creating i suppose extra opportunities for people in ireland to you know be able to build a system and put it in certain parts and soils of the country now the next thing i suppose what precipitated the review? What was one of the key things that drove it? And I suppose one of the key things was the EPA research and being able to incorporate that into the document. Um, one of the first key pieces of research we did was the one on the treatment options for low permeability soils. So that research was done um, back a number of years ago then. And the findings out of that has facilitated then bringing in things like drip dispersal or low pressure pipe. And the lads will be going into that later. The next piece of research was done was the whole thing around the sludging rates and guidance of that ha has changed and it'll be interesting to hear that and it's quite good now how it's done really and it's based on kind of population and size of your tank and stuff so that's very interesting but uh, you know there's a lot of that that came out of research is very worthwhile having in the document and then the last part then was really around the experience that we've gained since the original code so there's other factors that we said you know what while we're bringing in these pieces of research we can update the codes bring in these extra elements um that we need to bring in and that that's what was done as well just on the review process itself, as I said, I, I've mentioned, but we had expert assistance by Dr. Robbie Mean and then Professor Lawrence Gill as well provided technical support to that. And as indeed Stephen McCarthy was the key author on it as well. So they were key in writing the document and putting in some of the technical backup information. Then a lot of changes would have been put in front of the steering committee, which consisted of the EPA ourselves, the Department of Housing, Local Government Heritage, City and, Council, City and County Management Association, uh, Trinity College Dublin, the Irish On-Site Wastewater Association and Irish Water Treatment Association. So, you know, you had a good broad committee there to look at some of these technical aspects that were coming through and indeed they were all given due consideration. We had the public consultation, which went on from the 11th of December 2018 through to March 2019. And like, that's a key step in any car, car, cornerstone to any, if you like, public consultation or updating any guidance, because it's going to illuminate issues that you can say, right, have we considered this enough? Do we need to consider it more? What's the general sense out there in the community on these issues? So that was really invaluable for the people writing the document and the expert or the steering committee to see that, to kind of say, right, listen, have we taken on those and given them due consideration? 
And then in the final step in that then, obviously it has to go before the board of the agency for sign off. And then prior to that step, it goes to the Minister for the Environment, Climate and Communications. And we also sent it to the Minister for Housing, Local Government and Heritage. And, and that's stipulated that, that has to be done as well. So, you know, there's a good number of steps, I suppose, involved in that. It's, I suppose you have to say, it's not a short process. You look at the time frames here, but there's a value in that because when it's not a short process, that gives you the time frame to make sure everything is given due consideration. Um, and that's what we did. Um, and hopefully, as I say, look, we think we've got to a good document now. Reads well, flows easy. So that, that's a very good benefit um, for everybody involved, whether it's your regulator or whether you're involved in industry. Now, um, that's, that's that one on the expert process. And now I'm going to hand over to Stephen McCarthy now in just a second. And just before I hand over, I just remind you then, if you have any questions you want to start doing, feel free to start putting those in there so we can see them coming through. And now and I'm going to hand over to Stephen. OK, thank you. OK, thanks, Noel. Um, so good morning. Um, like Noel said, I'm going to go through um, um, some of the publication related information and uh, high level changes and Robbie will follow on then with more detail. Um, the code has been published under Section 76 of the EPA Act, the Environmental Protection Agency Act 92 was amended. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, it was issued on <clears throat> 24th of March 2021 and comes into effect on the um, on the 6th or the 7th of June. Um, it's been published um, in uh, online um, with an electronic form, the site characterization form, which is an appendix in the code is um, is published uh, separately in electronic form as well. There's an explanatory letter which uh, sets out the changes from the um, the 2009 code to the 2021 code, um, which is the basis really for this presentation as well. So um, what I'm going to cover here now and a lot of what Robbie um, will cover later is, is from that. Um, and we've also published a response to the public consultation um, so people can go in there and have a look and see how their comments were, were taken into account in revising the code. Um, all that's available on our website at that address there. <clears throat> Hard copies, we are doing a print run. Um, it's not available yet, but uh, we are doing one, so it'll be available shortly. So hard copies will be available from our EPA publications office. And if you're interested, email now. There's an email address there, publications at epa.ie, and uh, they'll put you on the list. So you'll get sent one when it's uh, available. Um, there have been two clerical amendments um, since we put it online in uh, on in March. Um, there's a T value, many of you be familiar there's a T100 value that's used at the start of the percolation test process or early on in it. It's kind of a cut off um, if, if, you, if you go above it, the, the test um, is discontinued. So that has changed from 300 to 480 if you look at the methodology in the code, but um, it, it hadn't been changed if just the figure hadn't been updated in the site characterization form. So that's been done now. So it's gone from 300 to 480 and there was um, some numbering um, in the groundwater protection responses in the appendix. So they're they're listed there, but the current version, the one that's online now, the site characterization form and the hard copy document all have those updates in it. So you should refer to those documents if you're downloading the code, download it from the version that's there now. Um, so that's that. Um, I'll go on to the next slide there. Um, the legal status of the code, uh, the code is issued under Section 76 of the EPA Act, uh, which provides for the EPA to issue codes of practice. And it refers to these documents as being practical guidance for the purposes of environmental protection. So that's what it is. It's issued as a code. It provides practical guidance um, in, in the relevant area, which is domestic wastewater treatment systems. Um, and there's a procedure there that we have to go through to issue it in terms of consultations and so on. And that's been gone through and it's approved and, and issued by the by the board of the EPA essentially. Um, the actual section of the Act doesn't say anything about compliance with the code or who has to comply and when and so on. It's really brought into effect through the building regulations um, and planning. So under the building regulations technical guidance document H, it says that systems for single houses should comply with the EPA code of practice 2009 wastewater treatment and disposal system serving single houses. And elsewhere then it says if a technical specification is subsequently revised or updated, which is what we've done here with the code now, then the new version may be used. So it's it's in there under the building regs. Um, and then 
when the 09 code was issued, there, would, uh, there was a circular went out to planning authorities, the, the local authorities and on board Panola from the from, from government, from the minister, um, um, essentially pointing them to it and, and the need for its use. And there's another circular has just gone out with this uh, code as well. And it refers to local authorities to the use of the code under section 22.2c of the planning development regulations. So that's the part that refers to site assessment as part of planning applications. So that's that's the code and how it has effect. It, ultimately, it's used as part of a planning application. So the competent authority and the, and the remit in relation to the decision making around cases, individual cases and sites and proposals, they're part of planning applications. So the competent authority and the decision making is by the local authority uh, and appeals mechanism is the same as other planning application matters on board Panola. Um, so that's the context in which the code operates. And um, the transitional arrangements for the code. So the code comes into effect um, on the 7th of June 2021 and replaces the 09 code. Um, so we we left a 10-week lead in, a long lead in, that um, so people could become familiar with the code, uh, read the document itself. We provided the explanatory letter and, uh, and the, the, the seminars now. So it's just give people enough time to adapt to it. Um, like Noel said, a lot of it is unchanged. Some chapters are practically untouched. A lot of the methodologies in it are the same. They've just been maybe extended in terms of the percolation test, uh, the trial pitting, stuff like that. A lot of that stays the same. So there's a lot the same, um, but there are there are some areas where it's changed. So hopefully this seminar and the letter will guide people to those um, and allow them to move on then. Um, the 2009 code may continue to be used where planning permission is already in train. So if there's an application already in and, and, and it's proceeding under the 09 code, that can continue. Or if a site assessment commen commences before the, the, the 7th of June, that can continue to be processed under the 09 code. Um, we've had a couple of queries around this, around um, particular whether the, the, two, the 2021 code could be used now. Um, and the EPA itself, we'd have no objection to the code being used now. I think it's a matter though, if 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 you're if you're going down that route or looking to go down that route, you'd need to talk to the local authority about it in terms of how it would fit in with um with the planning application system. Um, but that should be okay. Um, so the main changes, <clears throat> I mean the key the key the key changes here are I guess what's new and what's coming in. Um, are drip dispersal and uh, low pressure pipe distribution. So this comes from um, Noel referred to the research by Trinity College Dublin on these systems um, assisted by um, NUIG, uh, the National University in Galway and in Minute. So they constructed a number of systems and monitored them over time. Um, as was done previously with, with other systems in the past, you're probably be aware of some of the research that was done for the original code around other types of systems. Um, so you can see there the drip dispersal in top right um, trenches with pipe work um, and then the, the drip dispersal, I guess, is, a, is, is more, more different in that it's, it's pipes directly laid into the ground. Uh, both of them are, are um, shallow systems and the effluent is distributed under pressure. So that was researched by Trinity and conducted modelling as well in addition to that. And the recommendations to that research were to adopt drip dispersal up to percolation value of 120 and low pressure pipe distribution up to 90. So those have now been adopted into the code and Robbie will touch on that in a little more detail later. Um, the other area that was looked at was willow evapotranspiration systems, which are, you can see it there in the picture um, at the bottom left, I guess, of the slide. Um, they're essentially large excavated basins, basins excavated out, it's lined, soil is replaced and willows planted in it and the effluent is applied. They're very large and the idea is, uh, or the theory was that they would be large enough that evapotranspiration would essentially deal with the effluent and there would be no discharge or as it's been referred to zero discharge from the systems and the idea then being of course that they, they would be useful in areas which where the soils are impermeable and not suitable for discharge to ground. But the research in these cases showed that there was actual discharges from these systems uh, over extended periods of the, the winter. Um, in in I think in all cases, um, and that on that basis they would still they we've adopted them in the code, but they're like any secondary system in the sense that they will still need a tertiary element for the discharge ground, so a soil polishing filter under Chapter Ten of the code. So that's the the willow tra evapotranspiration systems. 
The other main change, and this this relates more to the operational end of things, um, and everyone knows, I guess, in in the industry, desludging is is an issue in relation to tanks, and you'll probably see from our national inspection plan reports that it comes up frequently as an issue, lack of desludging. Um, the current code refers to desludging once per annum, um, and Trinity College again did more research in this area, so they went out and they looked at sludge accumulation in tanks and measured sludge accumulation over time in tanks and they also um, looked at models from other jurisdictions on on this and based on that research this table has been adopted into the code so it allows you to, to pick a, a desludging rate per annum um, or how often you should do it um, based on the size of the tank, the tank usable volume and the number of house occupants. So you can see the example there for a tank. If you go down the left column, the first column, 3.5 meter cube tank. And then if you go across the top, a three, three, three person house, which would be about typical in the countryside from CSO, that it will be every four years. And then it varies if there's more people in the house, it's more frequent or if the tank is smaller. If you don't know the size of the tank, you just default to the first row, which is worst case. So that's a more uh, more targeted and uh, um, um, a, a better way of doing it now, and that should be very useful going forward. So that's the main the main and main changes. Um, I'm going to hand over to Robbie now. He'll go through stuff in a bit more detail, chapter by chapter. Uh, thanks very much. OK, thanks, Stephen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the more kind of technical aspects in a bit more detail, particularly with the, la the last um, six or seven chapters within the code, which deal with the site characterization element, which deal with the installation and also with the servicing and commissioning of the systems. So those are the areas that mostly are going to be kind of involved in on a day to day basis, I think. Um, and these are the practical changes really and how that what that means on sites when you're completing characterizations and when you're installing systems. So chapter five on site characterization, um, there's a terminology change there within the uh, the start of the chapter and the percolation test terminology has changed from T test and P test to subsurface and surface test. This is only a terminology change. It doesn't affect how the tests are completed. And going back even to SR6 in 1975, um, the, the test has always been completed in a 300 by 300 millimeter uh, hole that's 400 millimeter deep. Uh, back in 1975, the T label uh, was, it, it arises arose from the time taken for the water to fall in a subsurface test hole, a test uh, that was done at the invert level of the percolation trench. And that carried through in, in 1991 in SR6, and it sort of evolved into referring the T-test to the, the trench element of the treatment system. In the guidance manual in 2000, the P-test at the surface was introduced for the first time, and that was related to polishing filters. The P-label uh, came from polishing. So in essence, T and P, you're talking about two kind of binary, in a way, uh, solutions on sites. But if you look at the code now, there are a number of different types of arrangements for the infiltration area and the secondary and tertiary treated element of the systems. There's probably a couple of dozen arrangements you can have after your tank or your plant. So because of that, it's just been changed to a much more straightforward subsurface and surface test. The way of completing the test, pre-soak and twice the day before the test completed and then timing the falls as has always been the case, they haven't changed at all. With regard to the percolation test, the test methodology has also been amended though in one sense, to allow it to extend to a percolation value of 120, which is permissible using drip dispersal. So low pressure pipe distribution is permissible now with percolation values of 76 to 90, and drip dispersal is permissible 
percolation rates from 91 to 120. And this is also reflected in Appendix D where the percolation test is set out in more detail. Chapter six goes through, this is a, a full new chapter. It, within the last code, chapter three outline definitions and those definitions have been taken to the back of the document now they form a glossary so the other chapters have shunted forward in a sense and the, wh where chapter six is now this is a new chapter and it effectively determines site suitability and the appropriate dis di domestic wastewater treatment system in one discrete section after site characterization. So it talks about the requirements on sites and what's needed in order to make a decision as to whether or not a site is suitable or not. So section 6.3 there consolidates the minimum separation distances. And there's a new separation distance of 25 metres specified for free water surface constructed wetlands to neighbouring dwelling houses. And this arises from uh, both submissions that we had uh, that suggested that obviously with these wetlands where you have effluent at the surface, they should be as far away from dwellings as possible. And that's mentioned later on in the code in order to, to minimize, I suppose, the older nuisance to neighboring dwellings. But it also brings it, uh, the code in line with the Department of Heritage, Environment and Local Government guidance from 2010 on integrated constructed wetlands for agricultural soiled water and domestic wastewater. Section 6.4 consolidates the minimum unsaturated soil and or subsoil depth requirements on sites. Now these are in effect the same as the 2009 code, but provision is made for lesser depths for drip dispersal in low permeability soils. The reason for that is with these low permeability soils with values between 90 and 120, the groundwater is actually relatively well protected because the low permeability soils slow down the percolation of the partially treated effluent to the groundwater table. So there's lesser depth requirements there of 0.6 um, for drip dispersal systems and infiltration areas following tertiary systems where certain levels of E. coli treatment is achieved can also uh, reduce the minimum distances, the minimum depths required 2.6 metres. But that has to be proven, that level of E. coli treatment and the reduction has to be to a level of a thousand E. coli or less per 100 mil. Now within the last code, the depth requirements for tertiary filtration systems were not specified. And the 2012 clarification, which came out following the publication of the code, suggested that a depth of 300 millimeter uh, was suitable and was acceptable, but performance standards were required to be demonstrated. And those performance standards are not actually defined. So the steering committee considered this at length and decided that because of that tertiary treated effluent, because it will still have relatively high levels of contaminants within it, it has to be treated the same as secondary treated effluent. So 0.9 meter depths are specified in the code in this section for following tertiary treatment. Infiltrations for other tertiary treatment systems, as I said, they require these same depths of unsaturated soil and subsoil as polishing filters following secondary treatment systems. Section 6.5 covers the interpretation of percolation test results. And provision has also been made for low pressure pipe distribution and drip dispersal systems in this because we have the expanded bands with the percolation test results. Within both section 6.4 and section 6.5, there is provision made uh, and there's a suggestion that site improvement works, which are covered also in section 6.7, may be acceptable on sites that have less depths than the required 0.5 meter of soil and subsoil or percolation values less than three. But in these sorts of cases, it's recommended just like with the last code that you would discuss such site improvements work with the local authority before the report is generated and the solution is proposed. So chapter seven, as with the last code, covers septic tank systems, including percolation areas. 
In section 7.1, SR 66 requires that the septic tank nominal and usable capacities are declared. The declared usable capacity of the septic tank being installed on the site must be no less than the calculated design capacity. So the text has been amended and the table which referred to nominal capacity has been removed for clarity uh, to clarify this um, in this section. As well as this in this chapter, an effluent filter is suggested to be required following distribution into from the septic tank into the infiltration area that was I suppose in a sense buried in tables 8.1 and 8.2 of the last code but it's been brought into the septic tank section of the code now. The specification then for the wash gravel or broken stone aggregate in the last code the bands were from 8 millimeter minimum to 32 millimeter minimum but if you think about it, the perforations in the percolation pipes are eight millimetres, so that actually caused some issues where there was quite a lot of the lower range and um, lower, lower diameter range within the material. So that minimum um, limit in the range of washed gravel or broken stone has been increased to 12 meter millimeter to stop that clogging issue and that brings it in line with the the available type of gravel anyway 12 mil is effectively half inch so you're you're talking about something that's more readily available in hardware stores as well in section 724 and figure 74 the text and figure clarify that the top of the trench gravel should not extend above ground level and i think this is particularly important um, because in the last code, raised percolation areas could be constructed above ground level. And that is notoriously difficult to do because you're actually trying to, to construct above ground a straight sided, vertically sided bed of gravel or trench of gravel side by side with soil that's imported again side by side with gravel. And that's difficult to do first off if you compact it, you may get it relatively OK, but over time that's going to settle. And what was being realised was that in these situations, the percolation pipes ended up being askew. You get uneven distribution, you get potential breakout. So now the top of the trench gravel should not extend above ground level. And if you're installing a septic tank and discharging um, following that above ground level, you will discharge to an intermittent soil filter system. It's much more common sense and that's covered in the next chapter in chapter eight. I'll mention that in a second. Other criteria such as depth to bedrock and so on, they're covered in chapter six, so they're not repeated within this section. So chapter eight, secondary treatment systems receiving septic tank effluent and they, they comprise soil filters, sand filters, constructed wetlands and packaged media filters. I think even first off the title of this chapter it makes it a little bit clearer. These are the treatment systems that receive septic tank effluent directly. They're not the packaged wastewater treatment systems. Section 811 covers intermittent soil filters and the term intermittent soil filter is has been used for the first time to distinguish them from tertiary soil polishing filters which come later on in section 10. In the last code I think the term soil filter systems were used for both of those and there was a little bit of confusion owing to that so that has been clarified and I think in a general sense the the, the way the chapters are arranged in the current code is much clearer and much more common sense I think in a sense than the last code there was a, there was a little bit of confusion emerging because terms were repeated and so on with regard to the typical intermittent soil filter, filter requirements, now the, actually the term intermittent soil filters, that also, also brings us in line with the EN standards in that EN 1256 part 2 terms intermittent soil filters as one of the, the treatment systems that are acceptable uh, following a septic tank. The typical requirements are specified in table one and just like within the last code, there's a lot of detail um, within that table, but there are a number of changes and again, many of the changes just show more clarity with regard to what's required. 
So first off, there's expand, expanded depth shown. Each of the individual groundwater treat protection responses are outlined within the table itself. You don't have to go to the appendix at the end, which shows the groundwater protection response. Just like with the uh, percolation trenches, the eight millimeter lower limit of the gravel or crushed stone also increases to 12 mil and the option of pumping and gravity are included. That, that wasn't there within that table in the 2009 code, only pumped was specified. The pipe changes from a 32 millimeter specification to a minimum of 25 millimeter. So uh, there's, there's actually more options there. And again, that's more in line with industry standard. There's more detail on lateral separation. There's more detail on the use of hydraulic values when zoning, and there's a mention of a competent person in the design of such systems, which again wasn't specified within the last code. And we know that these systems have to be designed by competent persons. Section 812 on intermittent sand filters. Again, the term intermittent sand filters brings us in line with the EN standards, and they're used to distinguish them from tertiary sand polishing filters. Again, they were both included together within the last code under the same term. And the typical intermittent sand filter requirements are specified in Table A2. And again, within Table A2, there are a lot of fairly discrete but fairly specific changes that make things much, much clearer in terms of what is acceptable on sites. So the 2009 code in Table A2 had minimum thicknesses, but these are now separated out for both stratified and monograde sand filters. The minimum thicknesses required for the various groundwater protection responses, these are given within this table and again they were absent from table 812 in the 2009 code. There's more detail on the on dosing the sand in the filter and in the underlying or offset polishing filter. Again that was absent both in the 2009 code and in the 2012 clarification. There's the difference between 8 mil and 12 mil gravel at the lower end of the scale again. The pipe changes again from a minimum uh, from a, a specification of 32 millimetres to a minimum of 25 millimetres. There's lateral centre separation mentioning a maximum of 0.6 metres, not a rigid 0.6 metres as in the last code. And there's more information on the dosing frequency. There's more information on ensuring even distribution of the treated effluent within the sand filter. And there's specifications in there for the first time on flushing or scouring valves and references to back pressure. Further on in that chapter then, uh, other types of secondary treatment systems with regard to constructed wetlands and packaged media filters. There's a lot more detail on these also. In section 813 on uh, vertical flow reed beds, the areas required have been amended from a range of five to six meters squared per population equivalent in the 2009 code to now four meters squared and the sand and gravel versions of both of these have been brought in line to have the same area requirements of four square meters access to free water surface constructed wetlands that's required to be controlled by fencing to the given specification and these are, are as, as I mentioned, these are required to be located as far from the dwelling as possible with a minimum distance of 25 metres. The fencing is required because you've got effluent at the surface within these installations and that effluent can be relatively deep in places. So again, the idea was to make health and safety and risk to human health of the environment at its absolute minimum with these systems. Section A22, which covers coconut husk media filters, is a completely new section because coconut husk media filters have only emerged as acceptable systems and tested systems that are suitable for use in Ireland since the last code of practice was published in 2009. And Section A3, that covers willow bed evapotranspiration systems. Stephen mentioned these uh, a few minutes ago. The willow bed evapotranspiration systems, they're not zero discharge, but they are acceptable if a soil polishing filter or uh, another means of dispersing the effluent into the ground in line with section 10 is included, or if there's a discharge to uh, surface water acceptable. But with willow bed evapotranspiration systems, the section in there 
it it outlines that they have to be designed by somebody who has experience within design, the design of these systems, a competent person specifically with the design of willow bed of upper transpiration systems themselves. As well as this, there are a number of design requirements. There's a maximum width of 10 meters. They have to be dug down to 1.8 meter depth. They must have vertical sides with an angle of 90 degrees. As well as this, there has to be a distribution um, system at the base of them, laid in 300 millimeter gravel. They have to be lined by an impermeable uh, geomembrane, which has to have a minimum thickness of 0.5 millimeters. And these are big systems. The requirement is 187.5 square meters per population, per person within the house. So these cover extensive areas on sites. In chapter 10, tertiary treatment systems receiving secondary treated effluent. Again, this clarifies this much better, I think, than within the last code. The chapter has been divided into tertiary soil polishing filters for treatment and disposal of secondary treated effluent ground and tertiary treatment systems where an additional treatment module after the secondary treatment system then discharges to the uh, infiltration area. Now, the depths for tertiary treatment filters following, for example, a sand filter, they were not within the 2009 code. The 2012 clarification considered that performance standards needed to be demonstrated, but as I said, performance is not defined anywhere. So this precautionary principle of 0.9 meter depth after a sand filter must apply. Section 10.1 introduces low pressure pipe distribution and drip dispersal systems. They're included for the first time. And the minimum depths required, they've been previously specified for all of these systems in Table 6.3. So 0.9 metres is required in R1 and R21 areas, expect for, except for drip dispersal systems in low permeability soils and infiltration areas following tertiary tr systems where certain levels of E. coli treatment are, are achieved, as I mentioned earlier. And those depths are 0.6 metres. Now, I think an important point is that tertiary treatment systems, they may be used where treatment over and above secondary treatment is necessary, so for example, for nutrient and pathogens. So, for example, if you are in the zone of contribution to uh, a groundwater source that's providing drinking water, even though a site may have all the acceptable requirements with regard to separation distances, with regard to percolation values, with regard to the minimum depths required, there still may be a requirement for belt and braces and safety and to absolutely minimise the risk to remove pathogens um, from the outlet point of the treatment system. And that is the tertiary treatment that's appropriate in a situation like that. If you have high phosphorus in a groundwater body, then obviously a system might require extra a phosphorus box, uh, extra treatment for phosphorus specifically to take out that element before discharge to the groundwater body. But Tertiary treatment on its own doesn't mean that a site is going to be more suitable. It doesn't mean that the treatment is absolutely excellent and perfect and that the effluent coming out at the other end of the tertiary treatment system is almost pure. All the tertiary treatment systems do is remove specific elements of the range of nutrients and pathogen loads. So this should be borne in mind. And the way the code is arranged now is to try and ensure that tertiary treatment goes in where appropriate and the treatment performance of the system should match that need. And that's particularly reflected within the site characterization form. The latter end of the site characterization form, it must be specified why the tertiary treatment is needed. Within chapter 10 also, Table 10.1, this has always been the, the go to table, I suppose, for designing a system um, that is accepting secondary treated or tertiary treated effluent. First off, I think this table is a, a lot more user friendly now. Um, 
the the design of the trench lengths and the areas required, they're designed per population equivalent. And that makes it just much easier because you just multiply up by the number of people within the house. The last code had a had a, a bit of a mix and gathering of both per population equivalent and in some cases there were examples given of 5 PE so you had to divide by 5 and multiply by 6 or whatever the case may be and that has has been removed that that kind of complexity. As well as this in this table on the right hand side there tertiary infiltration areas. The sizings required for these they're specified for the first time also. And again, there was a bit of confusion within the last code because tertiary and secondary treatment systems uh, discharged into the ground were kind of lumped together. So I think that's much clearer also. With tertiary infiltration areas, even though you need the 0.9 meter depth, you may discharge to a much smaller uh, filter bed within the ground. So if you look at the left hand side there, for, as, for instance, for a soil polishing filter, at the lower end of the scale uh, with a percolation value between 3 and 20, you need 7.5 square metres. That's halved. It's halved all the way down for tertiary infiltration areas. So tertiary infiltration areas are still going to be potentially useful on tight sites, particularly on, on existing sites that are upgrading or whatever the case may be. As well as that, um, the, the areas or trench lengths are the only things that are specified now in this table loadings are not included in it as well. They can be back calculated if you want to do that, but it, the table is arranged only with areas and trench lengths within it. There's a, a, a slightly clearer element there, um, entry in the table where the percolation value is between 41 and 50 um, for option three, for the gravity discharge into 500 millimeter wide trenches. And that was a little bit a skew in the last document and it's been clarified and it's been brought in line with all of the other values within this table now. And obviously then also there are extra bands at the base of the table for low pressure pipe distribution and drip dispersal systems. Then finally chapters 11 and 12 with regard to installation operation and maintenance. There's reference, references to legislation and standards. They've been brought up to date in chapter 11. So the maximum number of outlet pipes from any distribution box or device, that has been increased from five to six. In the last code, the maximum amount of outlet pipes was five. And what that meant was for a population equivalent of six, where you're installing a conventional septic tank, for example, you would need three distribution boxes, which means that the risk of one of those boxes becoming slightly unlevel and maybe uneven distribution was kind of increased. And one of the most common types of distribution box available for use now in Ireland has six outlets. So we've brought it in line with that and it makes things much simpler. For a population equivalent to six now, you only require and need one distribution box. So that makes things easier on site, easier to install. And in terms of the EN standards, the, the EN standard EN 12566 part two, that actually specifies that the maximum number of, of outlet pipes from a distribution box should be five. And that was one of the reasons why that was included within the last code. But parts two and five of the EN 12566 series, they're not standards per se like the other ones are for tanks or plants. They're informative standards regarding infiltration areas or prefabricated infiltration areas. And national uh, annexes and national standards can deviate slightly from these because they're informative standards and in, in fact Ireland has always deviated in a sense from EN 12566 part 2 because the maximum trench length outlined within that standard in Europe is 30 metres. We've always had a maximum trench length of 18 metres or 20 metres so there's no issue with that slight deviation from the EN standard because it's an informative document.
Section 11.5 covers the installation and operation of low pressure pipe distribution and drip dispersal systems. And of note, I think in this, there's much more detail in this than in the last code, but of note also is particularly with drip dispersal systems. These are quite technical systems. They need competent persons designing them, installing them and servicing them. And the servicing of drip dispersal systems, unlike all other systems, has to be carried out every six months. And that's then section 1222 provides new guidance on determining the septic tank desludging frequency based on the tank size and the number of house occupants. And Stephen has outlined that already. So I'm going to hand over to Noel now to wrap up before we take our break. And I hope you got something from that presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Robbie. Um, and I hope you found those presentations now very helpful, uh, folks. We're after going through the review process, how all this happened and how it was all brought together and the people involved. And we've gone through the changes in detail. 